Okay, everyone, now as usual, let's do a quick recap of last week. Last week we looked at place management, and place management um, addresses crime prevention from the ground up at the local level, involving partnerships between government, community, non-government organisations and the private sector. Now, the thing with place management is that it incorporates crime prevention into these more general governance processes. And it ties in with broader neoliberal processes or governance strategies. As a result, it has the potential to be empowering or coercive, depending on how it's implemented and how data are collected and managed. In the uh, Victorian experience, the organisation and structure of partnerships is crucial to their, their success and also pretty complicated. Partnership members need to be empowered to enact real and organisational level change to policy and practice. Now let's have a chat about Assessment 2, which is coming up. It's the Annotated Bibliography. It's 500 words in total, and it's due on the 25th of September. Now, it's called the Essay Plan, um, but it really is, it boils down to an annotated bibliography of five different um, sources. You choose one of the four set essay questions and base your annotated bibliography on that. You need to uh, find uh, some of your own sources. Uh, and you're going to be assessed on your understanding of the key themes and concepts that come through these um, selected readings and how you are able to explain the relevance of each article to your selected question. So you might be able to say, well, this article is quite relevant, it has a lot of detail. Or you might say, this article is only part, you know, partly relevant, but it does address one key concept in some good detail or something like that. So it's an annotated bibliographic entry for five references. A maximum of two of those references can be taken from the weekly reading list. The rest you need to find um, using your own uh, research. Now, in uh, for each reference, you're going to want to have the full Harvard-style reference at the top. You're going to basically have a summary in words right, of the key points of the article, and you're going to discuss the relevance of this reference to the selected question. Now remember, it's 500 words in total. You don't need to count the full Harvard reference or headings or anything like that. But this means that you need to write in a clear and concise way. Be quite selective in what information you include in each entry. Part of the skill in research and processing this information and the concepts and everything that you're learning is being selective, knowing what to focus on and what to let go of, basically. Now, let's come back to structure because a lot of students seem to be a bit concerned about this. Start off with the full Harvard reference. You don't include that in your word count. You might want to quickly note who wrote the article and what's the purpose of the article? But don't waste too much word count on fluffing that section out. Just You might want to include that just briefly. Now, the real sort of core of this exercise is what are the key arguments? You need to give an overall summary, your summary of the key arguments of the article. You need to indicate some kind of evaluation of the article here are some things you might want to think about, and as long as you're careful with word count, you might want to focus on, like, well, here are some strong points about the article, here are some weaknesses. Now, what are some of the things you might want to discuss in terms of strengths and weaknesses? You might comment on whether the article uses a broad range of evidence or how it produces its data or evidence. You might want to talk about if the article is old or recent. Um, maybe it draws on some well-established theoretical resources, or maybe it's a good empirical study. Uh, and, you know, you, that will help you make that decision on 
how closely related it is to the essay topic. And building on your sort of summary and evaluation, you're going to say, well, here is how it relates back to the chosen essay topic. Here's how it supports the arguments I'm trying to make. So, how to pass. You only have 500 words for all five entries. So the key to this exercise, sorry, the key to this assessment, I should say, is summarizing, paraphrasing, and expressing ideas in your own words. So this means you might want to think about reading the source, taking notes, thinking about it, and something that I find can be helpful is imagine explaining these key points to a friend, obviously a friend not doing the course. That will help you process in your mind the most important bits um, and help you, you know, come up with a sort of a condensed or concise summary. Why bother with this activity? I mean, it's not just to make your life more difficult or to get you marks. It's because this kind of practice, it's not just research practice, right? It's about helping you process complex information sources, internalizing the key points within your own mental frameworks, right? And developing your own ability uh, to process these uh, retain the information and express these complex ideas to other people. If you can't express the idea clearly, have you really, um, you know, interpreted it very well? Okay, and that's what my next point on the slide is about. Why do we want to share ideas with others? It's less to do with sharing knowledge, although that's fantastic, that's important. But it's to do with the fact that we develop a deeper understanding of something when we are able to explain it to other people. So in my experience, uh, some students try to skip this internalization process and go from finding a source and locating a quote or idea uh, to then just repeating it in the middle of an essay without much nuance or without really demonstrating that they've understood and um, incorporated the ideas into their own um, mental apparatus. Believe me, it shows in the written submissions. So try to follow this advice so that you gradually get to the stage in your studies where you are using the references rather than the references using you. Now just quickly, uh, a look ahead to the essay topics for the final essay because you'll need to pick one of these to do your um, annotated bibliography. Now, the first one is about recent crime prevention policy and initiatives can be seen as highly politicized. Discuss the link between law and order politics, the fear of crime and crime prevention strategy using local examples. The second topic is citing examples provide a critical analysis of preventive policing strategies, e.g. hotspot, zero tolerance, problem oriented policing, etc. And discuss their impact on the community. And in your answer, discuss why these strategies are popular and if there are any side effects on police community relations. The third topic is the crime prevention industry is growing at a rapid pace in Australia and around the world. Critically discuss this trend and outline some of the key dangers that may emerge from the commercialization of crime control. And the fourth topic, discuss the importance of evaluation to crime prevention strategy. Why is it so important in producing effective crime policy and prevention strategies, okay? Have a read through those. If you haven't already, pick a topic to inform your literature search and thus your annotated bibliography. Now this week, we're looking at crime prevention as industry. Um, we're going to be drawing on the assigned reading to have a look at crime control industry in the US context. And then I'm also going to be looking at um, um, industry and regulation in the Australian context. And th that's going to be drawing on um, a, a recent journal article. Now, this week's reading is looking at 
how the prison industrial arrangement, the prison industrial complex in the United States presents itself to itself. And it does this by looking at um, one of their industry publications. So the American Correctional Association um, has a publication called Corrections Today. Well, well, it was called Corrections Today, and the name changed to Correctional News in 1999, um, and presents itself as a newsletter for the correctional building industry. Um, it has or has three main categories of content. It focuses on building prisons or parts of prisons, the equipment needed for prisons, and the running of prisons. Uh, it's a mix of paid advertisements as well as written articles, and some of these articles are also written by employees of the same companies that advertise their products in the publication. What I've got up here on the slide is an excerpt from this week's reading uh, to help give a sense of the tone of the publication. Now, in the back of your mind while you're um, reading this excerpt, remember that it's an industry publication for uh, corrections. Right? So, <clears throat> the July issue also contains two other extraordinary items. One consists of several pages of thanks to the sponsors of a banquet to be held at the annual Congress of Correction in Minneapolis. From telephone companies to manufacturers of bulletproof glass, they pay and prison officers celebrate. An additional attractive feature of the Congress is that you can leave the town in a beautiful, sporty, brand spanking new 1991 Dodge Daytona ES, fully equipped with every imaginable accessory. The only condition is that you visit the exhibit hall where the industry shows its products and get proof that you have been there. When you are registered in the hall, you are automatically a participant in the lottery for the car. So this, um, you know, is just, um, how should I put it? It's just, you know, industry advertising and schmoozing and having these, uh, you know, industry conferences. But, you know, you can kind of get a sense of how, um, I guess, sort of what kind of relationship the industry has to the, um, I guess, its core business, right, of act locking up people and preventing crime. It seems, based on this excerpt, a little bit detached to me. Now, the author of this week's reading um, reflects on the industry's self-concept, and they argue that there's an almost unbelievable construction of prisoners, that the, the way that they are talked about. Um, and you'll kind of, we'll touch upon this again later, how they're sort of constructed as uh, a natural resource rather than people. Um, there's a quite open exposure of the relationship between the correctional establishment and industrial interests. Um, this is not dissimilar to medical journals in the U.S., or how pharmaceutical firms um, are quite uh, apt in um, bribing doctors through sponsorship. The difference um, is that, according to this week's reading, uh, you know, doctors are supposed to be of a benefit to patients, but the American Correctional Association is another kind of beast uh, altogether. Um, I've directly quoted here as well, because I think that this is a useful um, quote. It is the organization with a mandate to administer the ultimate power of society. It is an organization for the delivery of pain, here sponsored for eating, drinking, and dancing by those who make the tools. So the author is reflecting on how quite a serious uh, social function um, and the, opera the, 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 I guess, um, carrying out of that function um, is also tied in with a lot of sort of commercial or corporate 
you know, practices and interests and ways of doing business that seem disconnected from its quite serious uh, core business. Now, this leads on to the private pressures um, behind, uh, you know, corrections as an industry. Um, as this week's reading argues, operating a prison is big money. You spend a lot of money to build them, you need to provide equipment, and you need to, you know, run, operate, and maintain them. Such that um, in the mid-90s, uh, the Wall Street Journal presented corrections as a promising investment uh, in the U.S. context. Um, and again, I've directly quoted here, The beauty of the prison management business is that incarceration rates are increasing faster than the prison budgets of many states and municipalities. Though the savings are difficult to measure, analysts contend that... and Wackenhardt is a particular um, prison um, being referenced in, in, in the journal. Um, typically can slash 15% from the $50 it takes government to clothe, feed, and guard an inmate each day. It's a win-win situation. Both taxpayers and prison companies benefit. So... This may seem strange, or it may not seem strange at all to some of you. The presentation of prison management as an investment opportunity and as something that uh, can be done more efficiently in the private sector um, than the government does. So it's, again, tying into that neo neoliberal uh, managerial rhetoric as well. Now, this may be shocking, it may not be shocking, but... What needs to be understood is that privatization when it comes to prisons is nothing new. They prison the, the modern prison as we understand it has its origins in private operations in the first place, uh, such as in England and in the United States. Um, you know, for example, prosecution used to be privately run, the police used to be privately run, um, local prisons uh, were privately operated um, and run by uh, alehouse keepers, like bar <laughs> barkeepers. Um, then we have the transporta transportation of convicts um, uh, as the result of private initiative or private business interests. Uh, and we're talking about shipping convicts across the Atlantic from England to the American colonies and so on. And there's a great quote here from the reading. Shortly after the first colonists arrived in Virginia in 1607, they were followed by a handful of convicted felons, transported there as a condition of pardon to be sold into servitude. Thus was set into motion a new penal system, a system that operated successfully for nearly 250 years. Now, what we might want to take away from that is that the central idea of how prisons should be designed and run, uh, was formulated by people who wanted to create prisons for profit. So, uh, the privatization of prisons um, is, is not new, it shouldn't be that shocking, given their uh, privatized origins. One such example of this is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, which was uh, a, a design for a prison. Um, it was effectively a circular wall of cells that surrounded a central guard tower. Now the point was that guards could see into every cell, but the guards could not be seen by the prisoners. So this meant maximum surveillance at minimum cost. So the concern here isn't rehabilitation or well-being or anything like that, but um, how, uh, or economic efficient, efficiency, basically. Now, Jeremy Bentham designed and developed plans for private contractors to run this prison design. And in fact, Bentham himself campaigned to obtain the contract for himself and invested a lot of his own money to acquire a site and develop a prototype prison, 
uh, but ultimately uh, lost that investment. That aside, the basic design of the Panopticon uh, became architecturally and economically influential um, in future years. And it should also be added as an aside um, that the philosopher and theorist Michel Foucault also used Bentham's Panopticon as a metaphor for how power operates uh, in society. Um, so it's had, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess a lasting impact across several domains. And I thought I'd just insert uh, an image of, the, I guess, the core idea of the Panopticon. And you can see the central guard tower, the cells um, in a circular design uh, around that guard tower. So hopefully this helps you feel visual. Um, and you can see how this would have been an appealing metaphor um, for Foucault as well, talking about the operation of power in society uh, and disciplinary power and uh, in that um, you know, getting populations of subjects to police themselves um, rather than having, you know, uh, a guard in every cell. You've got a guard in the central tower, and that serves as a metaphor for how uh, discourse and society encourages us to police ourselves because we are constantly uh, measured and monitored um, in multiple ways. Now, based on what um, the author of this week's reading uh, perceived from these uh, industry publications, was that there was a perception of crime as this unlimited natural resource. And the problem with this, with this is that the economic interests of the industry will be in favour of oversupply. There's a strong incentive for continually expanding the system. There's no incentive to reduce crime when there's money to be made locking people up. Privatization makes it simple to build and operate prisons in the modern context. It makes life simpler for governments, uh, for the state, uh, because it's no longer necessary to ask voters for permission to build new prisons, they can instead rent prison space from private industry or borrow money for the construction of new prisons. The state doesn't have to um, fork out as much capital on its own to achieve this. Private operation also allows the gov governments to manage uh, prison employee strikes um, in the private sector, um, governments could write up a contract such that uh, any employee strikes would be grounds for government to terminate that contract, and then they palm off responsibility for subduing the, the uh, prison employee labour force, prison guards and so on, um, and preventing industrial action. Another factor to consider is the idea of prisons as units of production. Prisons and prisoners are not always a strain on the economy. And you may think back to historical examples of concentration camps and gulags from Soviet Russia. Um, and these actually, in a way, continue in, um, through modern day equivalents. Um, the reading gives the example of a US prison that produces modules for new prisons. Inmates get assigned a job and they work a full shift every day, unpaid. Their uniforms are made in-house by prison labour, while uh, other industries or industrial activity uh, undertaken within the prison includes tyre recapping, uh, garment factories, um, the stereotype of you know making licence plates and also making highway signs for the state and so on. So in addition to the cost of building prisons, there's the direct income from prison labour. And this prison labour is engaged by state and federal authorities, 
uh, for you know things like making furniture and road signs, as as I mentioned earlier. So in in a sense, um, you know, state prisoners are already working for private industry in so far as their labor is made use of or exploited um, in the production of output that can be sold. And again, I've directly quoted from this week's reading to help us sort of think about this issue of convict labor. Um, an American worker who once upon a time made $8 an hour loses his job when the company relocates to Thailand, where workers are paid only $2 a day. Unemployed and alienated from a society indifferent to his needs, he becomes involved in the drug economy or some other outlawed means of survival. He is arrested, put in prison, and put to work. His new salary, 22 cents an hour. From worker to unemployed to criminal to convict labourer, the cycle has come full circle, and the only victor is big business. Another thing to think about with the, I guess, economic function of prisons is that <clears throat> prisons also don't just make stuff, they consume things. And what prisons consume can help keep local economies running. Um, and you'll find in the US context, at least, local uh, gov authorities are competing to get um, prisons located in their districts because they stimulate the local economy. Uh, prisons can be providers of labour and incentives. Labour, not the convict labour, but people working at the prisons. Uh, and, you know, they, prisons consume, you know, food and drink and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the prison boom can slow down the exodus from small towns and allow young people to remain in their own areas due to the direct and indirect economic effects of the prison being located there. So, prisons in the US national context. Now, historically, the right to punish was a privileged display of power and a profitable practice, insofar as the king would fine you or confiscate your property. Um, today, it, the political gains of um, the right to punish, uh, getting votes from the electorate, winning office, and displaying power. Expanding state expenditure on prisons also represents an expanding state apparatus. Now, the direct running costs of prisons are only one aspect. You also have police and judiciary costs. And law enforcement and criminal justice expenditure in the U.S. Uh, at the time of the article's publishing had grown at twice the rate of other federal spending and was approaching parity with the cost of U.S. military spending. So the cost of the war against enemies within becomes comparable to the cost of war against enemies without. And it's also worth noting that the prison industry absorbs uh, a fair amount of the potential workforce in the United States. In 1999, this was estimated that 4% of the available labor force in America was taken up by the crime control industry. Coming across to the Australian context, and the growth of the private security uh, industry became a key factor behind expanded regulation. There was increased public contact with security personnel um, and, and an increasing uh, recognition of the need for better management. In terms of the global picture, um, this industry emerged sort of rapidly during the 60s and 70s and in many countries, um, it outnumbers the police more than two to one. Um, globally, uh, there's an estimated 25.5 million uh, people working in the industry. 
uh, with an annual growth rate of 7 to 8%. And in Australia, um, between 06 and 08, there were an estimated 45,000 police and 112,000 licensed security providers, although many of these were part-time. What are some of the reasons for the growth of the sector? Um, there are a few factors. The main one appears to be market demand, uh, uh, driven by an increase in crime from the 1960s. But that increase in crime was also associated with increasing prosperity and personal mobility over the same period. So, you know, uh, you know were there more people to rob? <laughs> Full stop. Then we have the growth of mass private property venues like shopping centers, sports stadiums, and then improvements in the technology, changing workplace safety standards, increased litigation by victims of crime, and of course, post-September 11 uh, terror threats. Um, now, and also the current downward trend in crime, especially property crime, seems to be closely associated with the uptake of security and continuous growth in the sector. Now, what brought about these, uh, there were sort of two waves of regulations that we're going to look at. And what brought about the first wave were a range of misconduct issues. There was increasing exposure because of the growth of the industry um, to forms of provider misconduct. Um, the sort of prominent example is violence and negligence by personnel at entertainment venues. There um, was a violence problem more generally, uh, misuse of firearms and weapons and misuse of guard dogs. <clears throat> and there were also other issues around concerns around insider crime, general incompetence, lack of or poor standards and uh, recurring allegations of breaches of privacy. And given some of these issues, there were efforts made by professional associations in Australia to address these uh, misconduct issues through membership standards and such, but the scope for that was limited. There also existed certain forms of regulation dispersed through criminal and civil law, you know, employment, fair trading, privacy and weapons legislation, and also a reliance on market forces. But each of these also had a limited capacity to bring offenders to justice or deter misconduct. So, um, the main default regula regulatory mechanism um, that gets put in place is uh, governments legislating and administering occupational licensing uh, schemes. Now, these tended to have two main elements, a competency certification and an integrity certification. Internationally, Licensing systems have been established from the 1980s onwards. Uh, there's a huge variation in what their requirements are and how strongly these regimes are enforced. Uh, with European countries as examples of some of the more developed um, systems of licensing and regulation. Now when we come to the first wave of Australian reforms, in Australia, the regulation of private security uh, is the responsibility of the states and territories. The first wave of industry-specific regulation uh, was the New South Wales Security Protection Industry Act 1985, uh, which introduced licensing of security firms and employees. It had a certain criteria, such as specific qualifications and experience, disqualification for 10 years for offences against that act, as well as convictions for indictable offences. And it focused on uh, guards, consultants, and some security equipment providers. The police service administered the act, 
Um, they set the training standards at about two days with firearms accreditation after one day of training. Um, now, before 1985, New South Wales regulatory changes, it was a similar situation across Australia. Um, it was just tokenistic legislation that focused on people like debt collectors, private investigators, and some types of security guard. But um, up till that point, obtaining a license was all, more or less as simple as filling out a form, you pay a fee, and then you can basically strap a gun to your hip uh, and protect premises and go on patrol and provide cash carrying services. Now, there were, were a range of conduct related issues that got to this point. Um, the industry specific legislation was driven by a range of these problems. Um, uh, and a lot of it was driven by critical media attention. Um, New South Wales also amended other um, bits of regulation, such as the Firearms and Dangerous Weapons Act, in response to concerns around gun control and misuse, such as the 1984 Milpara Massacre shootout. Um, there were ongoing concerns that the original act um, allowed security guards to carry guns on private property without a license, and there were ongoing concerns about unethical conduct by commercial uh, and private inquiry agents, um, you know, to do with privacy and stalking and harassment. And so through the 1980s and 1990s, the industry again attracted negative publicity over perceptions of violence at licensed premises, and different state and territory leaders across this time uh, were identifying crowd controls as a problem. Um, deregulation of liquor licensing in the late 80s was identified as a key influence in these violence problems. Hotel and nightclub managers were criticised for permitting or even encouraging aggression on the part of the people they employed to control crowds. Um, and there was insufficient training, insufficient standards and so on. And the crowd controllers themselves were frequently victims of violence. In the mid-1990s, there were also a number of exposés of fraud by security providers. Whistleblowers at Chubb in Newcastle revealed that data readouts on client premises patrol checks were being falsified. The Australian Com Competition and Consumer Commission investigation in Perth uh, found that Wormold failed to provide adequate mobile patrol checks, and in Brisbane, undercover investigative journalists um, uh, led to the successful prosecution of Maine Nicholas for failing to provide contracted security checks on premises. Again, um, a few more issues as well in the mid-1990s in New South Wales. Uh, a range of adverse incidents triggered an inquiry. Um, there were allegations of underpayment in the industry. Uh, Labour costs were misrepresented in contracts and some security employers were abusing uh, federal government job start subsidy system uh, and terminating employees once the subsidy expired. And the this uh, inquiry, the, the Wedderburn report, found that persons with criminal histories uh, for burglary and armed robbery were being trained or licensed in alarm installation, including how to bypass and suppress security devices. So overall, it was still too easy in this new regulatory environment to set up a security business and work as a provider, with still only the most minimal requirements and checks being required. Now, the range of regulatory responses that, in reaction to this, uh, tended to revolve around introduction of compulsory pre-employment training and disqualifying offences, which we've touched on. 
but there were different training requirements across the states and territories for guards and crowd controllers. Some required 12 days, others 6, others 3 to 5. All jurisdictions um, introduced licensing for firms and contract guards and crowd controllers. And um, except for the territories, um, licenses or licensing was required for inquiry agents, private, private eyes. But otherwise, there are significant gaps and inconsistencies in the regulations. Um, you know, it wasn't clear uh, when it came to bodyguards or security consultants, control room operators, installers and repairers, and locksmiths and trainers. One of the key drawbacks of this first wave of reforms uh, was that there were no measures developed to assess the impacts of these reforms. So there was little evidence about what actually worked. As a result, however, the inadequacies of the new regulatory systems um, became quickly apparent uh, as there were more sort of there was more media scandal and expose of misconduct. So there were further conduct issues uh, during this second wave of reforms and reg uh, and regulatory change. There were ongoing problems associated with security guards and firearms and safety throughout the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, there are, I've got a few examples listed there on the slide. There was a shootout in Brisbane between armed robbers and armoured car guards and several injuries including a passerby who was left paralysed. <clears throat> In Adelaide, a shopper in a crowded street was hit by a bullet that was fired by a security guard at intruders. And in New South Wales, there were thefts of firearms from security guards and security firms. And then there was this continuous problem of assaults associated with licensed premises. Um, and I've listed some of the key uh, incidents there as well to sort of factor into the equation. Now in uh, 1997 Western Australia uh, conducted a review and it found that police there attended 900 false alarm calls per week relating to intruder alarm responses. So there was a false alarm activation rate of about 94%. There was also the um, issue of insider crime. There were strong suspicions around one of the guards involved in Australia's largest armed robbery at the time, which was $2.2 million stolen from an armoured van. And then um, some of you may remember transit um, security on uh, city rail trains. So in Sydney 2005, the New South Wales Ombudsman found that transit security were exceeding their powers making arrests and using unjustifiable force. The New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption conducted an investigation in 2008 into security guard training and found several issues, some of which included uh, falsification of attendance records at training, um, issuing certificates to trainees who hadn't actually shown up to any classes, um, and issues around cash payments for certificates, um, for training certificates. Uh, one institute was believed to have falsely obtained about $1.3 million from inappropriate payments in this regard. Now, with regard to the regulatory responses during the second wave of reforms, these responses were piecemeal and complex changes to existing regulatory frameworks. Um, some states used the existing legislative base from the first round of reforms. Others introduced entirely new acts. Um, broadly speaking, licensing was extended to almost all areas of security work. So this now included locksmiths, consultants, in-house security personnel, the people who train them, and 
the people who install electronic systems and monitors. There were more disqualifying offences and regulators were given greater powers to deny or suspend licenses on discretionary grounds. Uh, and in some cases, such as in New South Wales and, Austra and South Australia, uh, regulators were able to um, uh, deny or suspend licenses without having to provide a reason. Um, mandatory fingerprinting was brought in for more reliable criminal history checks. And um, the Council of Australian Governments, so all the different state governments, um, recognised this issue of the need for national consistency in regulation um, and also recognised the sort of contributions that private security can make in a post-September 11 counter-terrorism security environment. So the uh, Council of Australian Governments recommended regulatory harmonisation um, and there was the introduction of nationally accredited certificate level courses, but harmonisation was stimmied by New South Wales, who at the, the Premier um, of New South Wales at the time argued that um, harmonisation would actually lead to a decrease in the quality of the regulation in New South Wales. So a few critiques that this article um, sort of raises, and part of it is that Rather than the uh, typical, I guess, neoliberal story of government over-involvement, uh, if anything, under-regulation has been the norm in, in the Australian context. There's been a reliance on the uh, supposedly uh, regulatory powers of the market combined with simple government licensing schemes, but this has led to repeated instances of regulatory failure. Uh, numerous scandals led to three major inquiries between 2007 and 2009, so the Australian Crime Commission, the Fair Work Ombudsman and the New South Wales uh, Independent Commission Against Corruption. And the findings were, broadly speaking, that there was extensive and entrenched misconduct across the industry. Now, these problems in the Australian context are actually common across the industry uh, throughout the world, particularly in those jurisdictions with less regulation when it comes to private security. Uh, notably, Australian governments continually failed to take on board warnings about the risks of misconduct or adopt best practice models suggested by uh, the industry itself through industry associations and scholarly academic research as well. So there were critical failures of consultation and accountability. Now, the area of training remains an ongoing concern. Um, at, at, the, at the time of writing, the article claimed that there was no legislative requirement for public disclosure of training methods and quality control, right? And that um, the national certificate requirements only apply to operatives, but there are no requirements for the holders of a company license or government security managers to have training. An, exam an example is in Queensland, it's, it was still possible to obtain security consultation licenses without undertaking any training. So this brings us to a range of recommendations and considerations. There are quite a few up there on the slide. I'm not going to read through them all, but one of the key issues is national consistency. This remains a problem as there are significant differences between jurisdictions with regard to things like the licensing categories, the terminology that gets used, and the fee structures. And there are also differences when it comes to drug and alcohol testing, uh, disqualifying offences, how long the disqualification period is, uh, criminal history checks, firearms, controls, and things like that. Another concerning issue that has never really been systematically addressed at a national level, despite ongoing media coverage, is the violence associated with crowd control in and around licensed premises. Um, the article argues that reform of crowd control and liquor licensing it's to tie in with this idea of responsive regulation and smart regulation principles. Um, and that such regulation needs to better consult uh, with practitioners, incorporate 
standard performance measures and um, routine, routinely report on them and you know reassess and reevaluate the impacts of regulatory strategies so that changes can be made where necessary. And one of the suggestions from the article is um, having a small department within the Attorney General's department to take a proactive role coordinating the development of a model regulatory act um, that all jurisdictions could adopt through the COAG process, the Council of Australian Governments. So a few key points to summarise what we've talked about this week. When it comes to crime prevention and crime control as industry or product, different incentive structures are at play that are not necessarily aligned with the long-term aims of crime prevention or concerns about justice. Um, crime prevention and crime control can have indirect flow-on economic consequences. Some of these things include the renewal of regional and rural economies, employing or occupying a certain portion of, of a society's available labour force, and also providing cheap, or some would argue slave, labour for the state and private commercial interests. There's a lot of room for misconduct in the absence of any clear and consistent regulatory frameworks. Until the mid-1980s in Australia, there was no industry-specific regulation. From that point on, um, there have been a series or a few waves of reactionary and piecemeal regulatory fixes that are, have mostly been in response to publicised scandals. And there remains a need for proactive and responsive regulation instead. So not about band-aid fixes, but thinking long-term and big picture. Now, there are a few question and discussion points um, that you may want to think about. What does it mean to discuss crime prevention and control as a product? Does it really matter whether or not crime prevention is a product and why or why not? How might crime control as an industry complement, fit in with, or expand upon crime prevention and crime control as a state or governmental concern? And what are some of the risks and challenges in placing whole or partial responsibility for crime control in the hands of commercial or private interests, rationalities or organisations? Next week we are looking at alternative modes of crime prevention, restorative justice and reintegrative shaming. Uh, we've got the two readings listed up there. And a few, or oh, two guiding questions for you to think about while reading through this. One is, what role should concepts of justice play in our thinking about crime prevention? And additionally, how might the ideas and practices of restoration and reintegration contribute to our crime prevention efforts? Lastly, uh, I've got the two main references that I've used to um, inform this lecture up there for you as well. Obviously, this week's reading and, and also um, the evolution of security industry regulation in Australia, which is a journal article that you may want to have a read through as well, particularly if you're thinking of doing um, this topic as an essay question. All right, all the best.